Welcome to Mershman Seed's Cup of Joe. On this episode, Will Swope from Next Gen Seed in Hope, Indiana, along with our Mershman Seed's area sales manager, Brett Ward, gives us insight on current planting progress, soil conditions, and wheat in their area. Ben talks about how weather conditions affect finishing out your wheat crop. Hear what Joe has to say about our 50th year selling private line soybeans. Hi, this is Joe Mershman. Welcome to Mershman Seed's Cup of Joe, episode number 38, season three. Today we have Turk and Ben, and we have a special guest, actually two special guests from Indiana, and I'll let Ben introduce them. Yeah, today we have Brett Ward, area sales manager for Mershman Seeds, and we have Will Schwope, um, a new dealer for us in Hope, Indiana. And uh, I'm going to start off with Will. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, and uh, you're a new Mershman dealer. Why'd you, why'd you jump on, on with Mershman Seeds this past fall? Hey guys, thank you for having us on. Um, my wife and I, Jennifer, uh, live and farm in Hope, Indiana with her mom and dad. Uh, we run about 2,000 acres of corn, beans, and wheat. Uh, we have a small cattle operation as well. Um, and my wife and I, Jennifer, started the seed uh, dealership business to kind of add a piece to the farm so we could come back and, and actually farm with her folks. Um, and we've been a dealer for five years now. This is our first year with Merchant Seats. Um, we really, really enjoy working with you guys so far. Um, just seems like it's a really good organization and uh, we were really pleased with the product and, and the job that you guys do. When you say you're gonna do something, you do it and stick to it. And that really means a lot as a, as a dealer and a farmer. So we were really pleased to work with you guys. That's awesome. A um, couple quick questions, you know, like what are the, you guys, we were talking before the, the show aired, what, uh, how many beans have you been put in the ground? You're talking about a lot of planters rolling since the beginning of April. Tell us a little bit about um, how early planting started, what were temperatures like, what are temperatures like now? A lot of planters still rolling. What, what do you guys got going on in the Hope, Indiana area? Um, there's been quite a few uh, early beans get out this year. Uh, we got really warm, like in the 70s, the first week of April here. Um, and the ground conditions were, they were beautiful. They were really nice. So a lot of guys took advantage of that, especially on those uh, marginal acres that they know are usually wet and they fight and they were just ideal at that time frame. So they said, we're gonna chance it and we're gonna plant some. Um, and see what happens. And since then, we've had a lot of cool weather, not necessarily wet, but cool weather, um, overcast days, um, just really not ideal. The ground temperature has varied anywhere from, I'm gonna say 45-ish, um, maybe 52, 53, but uh, the daytime temps have been reasonable and have warmed the soil up but the night times have stayed so cool that we just lose everything that we've gained in the daytime. So ger germination and emergence has been very slow here. Uh, there, there has been some corn and some beans just barely even emerged or corn spiking. Uh, Tuesday night, we had almost three inches of snow here. We got down pretty cold to, I think 28 was the low. Um, so, we're not sure yet what that's going to look like to some of the stuff that was just emerged. Um, some of it might be okay. Some of it might have got dinged a little bit. Um, they, everybody said seven to ten days will kind of know better picture of where we lay. Um, but there's there's been quite a few acres get put out early this year. It's it's really been surprising. Um, the last several years here has been very wet spring, so. I think a lot of guys' mindset was I'm not getting burned again with wet weather and, you know, replanting or not even doing anything until June. So they saw an opportunity and said, if we can get this stuff in the ground and get it going before the rains come, let's do it. So I think that was kind of kind of the mindset this year. Yeah, that's kind of a message that uh, we're hearing all over the board. If you if the guys had the opportunity to jump in early, they definitely jumped in 
early. Um, Brett, I was talking with you on the phone this past week. You guys are further along with your wheat crop than what we are up here. Tell me about the wheat crop in the area. Tell me about what staging you guys are at. Is it looking good? We got good good color. We got good prices. Are we going to have good yields this year in your guys' area? The, the wheat in Southern Illinois that I've been watching, it's, it's flag leaf to merge. Um, it's got good color. Um, I'm not seeing any disease in it. I'm not seeing any insects in it. It's, it's looking good. Um, the next thing I think we've got to worry about with that wheat crop is getting a fungicide application on for head scab. Um, I looked at Will's wheat before I stepped in here and I, his flag leaf is just starting to emerge and I, they're a week behind. Yep, that's about where we are. We are in, in our growing region. The flag leaf's just now starting to poke its little head out. So within a week or two here, we are going to be with this warm weather. I think we're going to really see that wheat progress. Has, it, has the wheat seen any stresses or, you know, were we, were we looking at record wheat crop this year? I think yields are going to be good. This cold snap this week, I don't think it's affected the wheat. Um, we probably dodged a bullet. Tuesday night in Karma, I had 32 degrees. Wednesday and Thursday night, I had 34 degrees. And that was right at the break of day. And we had a quick warm up after that. Maybe we had a light frost. Um, looking at the cold snap, I don't, I don't think we're hurt in my area of Southern Illinois from it. I don't know. Did you have a frost here, Will? Um, there was quite a bit of snow. So snow cover? I, I mean, yes, but there was snow cover on a lot of stuff. Uh, from what, what, what we've seen, at least on the wheat, it doesn't look like it really got hurt. Now, there, there might be some tips of the leaves that maybe got burnt a little bit, um, or maybe in some real low-lying areas that stayed a little cooler longer, maybe, maybe got dinged a little bit, but overall the, the wheat bounced right back out of it and I mean you can't even tell today that it it even affected it. It looks really good. We, we think the wheat crop here looks as good as it's looked in a long time. We just just had a really good winter for it and uh, just so far a good spring haven't had too much water. Um, so there's there's a lot of good looking wheat in our area. You just have to remember one thing with wheat uh it has nine lives, so it would probably be okay. And, of course, um, the cooler it is, uh, it actually favors wheat, um, particularly just like corn. The longer the fill period, the cooler it is, uh, the, you know, the, the more time it has to get kernel depth and kernel quality. So, you know, in the years when we have those big corn crops, it's not when we have a lot of heat and it pushes the crop forward fast. It's actually the years when we have it a little bit cooler is when it does the best. So we'll see how this all turns out. But, um, you know, uh, very important to get that fungicide on because uh, um, it can turn wet too yet. Oh, Will, are you going to, did you plant some early wheat or uh, are you going to try and do some double crop over there? Yeah, uh, double crop beans works really well. We're just far enough south here that uh, it's it's usually ideal. Uh, we usually harvest our wheat the last week of June, 4th of July, right in that time frame. Mm -hmm. um, so we usually get the wheat off quick, get the straw baled, and we can roll almost right behind the balers uh, with the with the bean planters. So we we can actually raise some really, really good double crop beans. I mean we can we can hang with the first crop being some years if we get the rains in August. So it, it works out really well for us here. Awesome. Maybe some opportunity to sell some, uh, some uh, double crop uh, soybeans over there too, if there's uh, quite a bit of wheat in your area. Yes. Yep. That fits in real nicely with the, the, the KD15 wheat that we have, you know, just to talk about that product. I mean, that's the probably one of the highest yielding ultra earlies that we have out there. And that's why it really fits Will's market and our market here in southeast Iowa where we're not quite quite as far south where we get a lot of the extra heat but you know if we can get that wheat off as soon as possible and still have high yielding wheat you can really get nice high yielding soybeans to follow. Yeah generally when it comes to double crop if, if you can get that crop in before um, the first of July you can raise a pretty decent 
uh, double crop even in our area. It just seems like when the days start short, shortening up, that's you know, the moisture goes away and, and you can't get that soybean crop out of the ground. So it's really important, like, like Will says, to try to get it in in June when you still have some moisture. Closing thoughts is what I always like to ask everybody um, that's on Cup of Joe. What are you guys doing different this year? What, 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 what are you changing this year compared to last year? Is there anything changing in your guys' operation that you're excited about um, moving into the 2021 crop year? We've been doing every year more and more cover crops, and that's kind of something that we're looking forward to in the future to implement more into our operation. Uh, we're seeing a lot of good soil health benefits um, and a lot of residual effects from the cover crops too that help our crops. So that's worked out good for us. Uh, the Enlist platform working with Merchman is new for our operation this year. We're, we're excited about that to, to get several products out on our farm and our customers' farms uh, so we can get some data back and get some feedback on that. Uh, we're, we're excited about the list platform. We can actually have options to go out there and, and control weeds where the last several years we've been struggling. Um, it's not been a real problem, but there's definitely been some problem areas and uh, we're, we're really looking forward to being able to control those problem weeds rather than deal with them or, or hoe them out or pull them or whatever guys are doing. So that's, that's going to be really nice for us this year. Do we have any other questions for Will and Brett while we're on? Well, Will, we just appreciate your support and uh, you're doing a great job for us over in Indiana and we look forward to many years of uh, doing business with you. We thank you. Well, like if, you, if some customers are uh, listening to this and want to, know, want to try and get a hold of you, what's the name of your dealership or how they get a hold of you? Uh, it's Next Gen C, um, and you can get a hold of me at 812-343-9275. Um, feel free to reach out anytime. Thank you. That's awesome. Thank you Thanks, guys. guys. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Appreciate it. Thanks, Brett and Will. We appreciate the report. Ben, what do you got for us today? We kind of touched and covered on a little bit with what they were talking about. Hope Indiana's temperatures were pretty similar to where we were at here in southeast Iowa and for a good portion of the country. It's not like the south was a lot warmer than the north. Um, but we did have April 20th, the morning of April 20th, we were at 32 for a low. April 21st was 29, and April 22nd was 30.4. I wanted to talk about some key temperatures um, for wheat that we look at and we look for. So with wheat... Um, when we are in the jointing stage, so before uh, flag leaf, full flag leaf emergence, before boot, before your flag leaf starts to elongate, when we are in jointing stage, we can handle 28 degrees for two hours before um, 24 degrees for two hours before um, damage starts occurring to yield. And once we get to boot stage, that goes from 24 to 28. So we didn't get down that low. Nobody in our main growing areas really got down that low. I don't think we're going to see a yield impact on the wheat from this last cold spell that we, we kind of dropped down into. Um, for soybeans, and that, that was air temperature that I was talking about in comparison to ground temp. So um, past 10 days, we've only accumulated nine growing degree units. So there's a lot of corn that if it was planted around that April 5th time frame, just we're not progressing it's still it's, there it probably has germinated it's got a radical on it but it's sitting in the ground and that's that's it's unfortunate but with uh, monday tuesday's weather coming up i think you're going to see a lot of stuff that's in the ground finally pop through um i got some articles that i'm going to queue to we're starting to get some questions on fungicide and we're going to talk a little bit about short shortages of product here in a little bit too but um this Crop Protection Network that Iowa State and all the land-grant universities mm -hmm. and even some Canadian universities are involved in, they're really coming a long way with this Crop Protection Network website, and it has fungicide effic efficacy charts that combine a whole bunch of data. So it's got all the brand-new products, which products it works best on. It's got a table here that basically decodes what's in each one of them, so there's a lot of overlap in the industry with herbicide and fungicide. So you can actually see which active ingredients are in each one and which products are the best on your target um, weeds that you are, or the target pathogens that you're trying to go after. And they have that for corn, soybeans, and wheat. So if Great. you don't have your fungicides bought, you know, this big recent rally in price, everybody's gonna want to uh, spend a little bit extra money for the chance of maximizing your yield. So 
Um, that's a great chart there. So if you can't get the fungicide you want, that gives you a whole bunch of list of others that will do just as well. Well, that hopefully. economic threshold keeps going down. The more prices keep going up too. So that's correct. So it's almost going to be an automatic pull the trigger on on fungicides. So yeah. That is what I had this week. So I'll, I'll I'll link to a whole bunch of that and maybe another article from um, University of Nebraska on some more um, imbibitional chilling. But I think that hopefully is behind us this week yeah. with the cooler temperatures. Definitely a busy time, Ben. No question about it. Uh, Turk, what do you have for us today? Well, we, we kind of alluded to the the uh, fungicide market, and, and it's just not the fungicide. It's the herbicide market as well. There's a, We're starting to pick up uh, information that there's going to be a uh, significant shortage in uh, especially some of the generic uh, glufosinate products, and, and uh, now we're picking up uh, glyphosate as well. So I think the message is uh, we talked about this a while back about the, the potential shortage of getting transportation, getting delivery, getting everything in your shed, and I think you cannot stress enough the importance of, of getting that herbicide or any product that you need to put your crop in this year, whether it be fungicide, your herbicides, everything else, get them in your shed and get take possession of them right now because you may not get that product later as the as the demand has been talked about. The demand is going to be higher than it's ever been to use fungicides and uh, and you don't want to you don't get want to get caught with your pants down so to speak by not being able to put get your herbicide or some other thing on to um, that's going to help protect your crop. I mean, it's it's these inputs are very very important. Yeah, I agree with you, Turk. Uh, we've been been talking here this week, and that's that was been the big news that the Liberty Roundup type products are are um, are becoming more expensive or short or both, and uh, that's where your if you do business with a, a reputable supplier and, and you have a history of continuing to do business with them, they're going to take care of you. Um, uh, I was talking to our local retailers here about uh, the Liberty Supply, and they said they were fine. In fact, they had a little extra. So, um, and again, it's just it's back to uh, if you're out there looking for the lowest price, those are probably the guys that ain't gonna be able to come up with it this year. So, uh, big caution out there about this herbicide thing, and just in general. I mean, we talked about this several months ago about how everything is getting harder to get and taking longer to get and you know it's in every industry i talk to folks you know that sell lumber i talk to folks you know that uh, do uh, uh, cars i mean everything it's just it's it's really going to make it hard to do business and things are there's a, a game changing thing going on right now so and you can't find a trucker to get it, to get it delivered either i mean that's another issue that's that we're every, the whole in, industry's facing on everything Speaking of supply, getting supply, we've got excellent supplies. Uh, we're starting to pick up some uh, some uh, business from companies that uh, from our competitors who uh, promised their customers that they would have enlist soybeans for them, and and they weren't able to supply them, and so they called us, and we still have excellent supplies of uh, all enlist soybean uh, varieties. So. Uh, you know, like I always say, Turk, you know, I, I took the limit off today. You took the limit off? I took the limit off. You can buy all you want right now. <laughs> That's our internal joke. <laughs> but we're, we're in good good uh, position. Uh, uh, trucks are rolling. We've uh, got, we have several layers of delivery. As you know, we have our salespeople have trailers that they can deliver these small amounts in a very timely order. And then we have uh, the, the two-ton trucks that, that can do up to 300 units in, in a very fast, timely manner. And, of course, our semi. So, um, we tend to really shine when it comes to delivery and, and in-season business, so we do our best anyhow. Yeah. So the other thing I've got, Joe, is uh, we can't uh, can't do this episode without having a conversation about markets. They were red hot again this this week. I mean, set new contract highs uh, for corn and soybeans. Corn corn is over six dollars now. Soybeans are over fifteen dollars uh, for the first time. I think we're having a setback. Uh, probably on Friday, but uh, uh, again, that's kind of be expected. Soybeans have been up for for uh, seven days in a row. and uh, That broke through the second highest ever, right, yeah. on soybeans, second mm -hmm. highest ever. Yeah. So, uh, and I've, I've been reading the reports too, uh, Turk, and it just says that the next few weeks are going to be, be very interesting. We're basically in uncharted waters 
they're thinking that uh, USDA possibly underestimated our supply in 18 and 19, or, you know, what was out there in the bins. And, and if this all catches up and then the demand side, um, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. I, I, we, we, this week uh, at Lafayette, Indiana, the basis was 50 cents over Chicago. Wow. I mean, that's unheard of. So that tells us the demand side on soybeans is still very much there. And, th and this week, e even with these higher prices, usually we see a cutback in basis. It went the other way this week. When prices went up, basis narrowed so or, or improved. And so that means the people are trying to get their supplies covered, and, and they're worried about that as well. So soybeans are corn are following the lumber and everything else, aren't they? The commodities and then, in and general. Then throw in some dry weather in uh, South America, and uh, and here we are. Got a supply shortage and a weather market all at the same time means uh, record high prices. Well, the key is going to be how, how well this crop goes in. Of course, it's going to be close to 80 degrees next week. Um, that's positive. And, and how this crop goes in will determine, you know, if this market is going to keep going up. And then, of course, what happens after that crop goes in? Is it going to stay dry? Is it going to have plenty of moisture? Uh, it, we have to raise a crop this year or, or these prices uh, are going to go through the roof. Uh, when Joe Sinclair was on, we talked about the possibility of, uh, of uh, $30, $30 soybeans. Yeah, and, hyperinflation. Yeah, we hyperinflation. And, <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I don't know where it's going to stop. Well, um, I just had uh, something that kind of struck me this morning when I got up. You know, uh, uh, this is our 50th year selling private line soybeans. And believe it or not, uh, we first sold our first private line soybeans back in 1971. I was 16 years old, uh, and we had a company called Midwest Research Corporation that is a group of uh, seed companies that went together to ascertain the very, very best, highest-yielding private line soybeans. And if, if you go back to 1971, there wasn't that many independent plant breeders. Uh, the universities were the main company or main organizations that supplied genetics, and uh, they had they had the control of, of the soybean industry uh, back then when it came to new products. So there was a few startup uh, genetic uh, soybean companies and, and a group of seed companies from all over the Midwest start this corporation called Midwest Research Corp. And uh, I think there were, I don't know exactly how many companies, but I think there was eight to 10 companies at that time. And what we would do is we would ascertain uh, the very, very best variety from different breeders, not necessarily one, and then we named them, just like at that time, you know, there was Williams, Amsoy, Corsoy, uh, all the soybean varieties were named, and we named them, and we sold them. Each company sold that name, but under their own uh, terms and conditions and, and in their own territory. And believe it or not, all those companies uh, from Midwest Research, all these independent companies, they're all gone. We're the only ones left. And it just struck me funny that, I know one day I asked Dad, and I said, how come we're the only company left out of this group of Midwest Research Corp? And he goes, well, you know, I wanted to keep the business going for you kids, you know. I wanted, wanted you to be a part of it. And I thought about that, and the family farm is all like that, too. You go through a lot of turmoil, a lot of stress, but you keep going because you want, the, you want to pass it on to the next generation. So, but anyhow... Uh, we're the only ones left, and, we're, and we still use that same naming system. So that's why we use names, because it all started back in 1971 when we introduced our first private line soybeans. Cool. So a little bit of history there. Now, So now for the corny joke. So in, inside our company, we have this uh, goal. It's every year that on May 1st, we have all the seeds shipped. It's all delivered. It's all on the farm, because, you know, farmers got to have seed before they can plant so theoretically, on May 1st, we should be completely done shipping seed, nothing to do, and always say, let's go fishing, right? Well, that's never happened yet, but that's <laughs> our goal. We want to go fishing. So I thought, well, I'm going to bring a couple fishing jokes to, uh, to the table today. So this one here kind of uh, resembles the, the, the snowman joke I told you, you know, where we said, where do snowmen uh, keep their, their money? Well, this one here, where do fish keep their money? In a river bank, okay? Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Now, this one here is uh, about a, a fisherman. He was driving home from a big fishing trip, and it was pouring down rain, and he got a flat tire just outside, just outside a monastery. A monk came out, invited the man inside to have dinner and to spend the night. The stranded fisherman motorist gladly accepted the monk's offer. 
That evening, the man had a wonderful dinner of fish and chips. He decided to compliment the chef. Entering the kitchen, the man asked the cook, Are you the fish fryer? No, the chef replied, I'm the chipmunk. <laughs> I'm the only one laughing. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Anyhow, got to get you back out in the field. <laughs> so hopefully this week we hit it hard in the field. We don't get too much rain. And uh, with the warmer temperatures, we'll get those fast emerging stands. And uh, we'll see you next week. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs>